Right, so uh, welcome back everyone uh, after lunch. Um, and uh, so after this morning's that, uh, uh, work where there was uh, quite a lot of technical uh, stuff about uh, introductory machine learning stuff, and we'll be some more about that um, tomorrow when we look about deep learning. But we're going to go on to a different tack this afternoon. Uh, because one of the aspects that we're doing within this summer school is to cover not just technical aspects, but also uh, the legal and societal aspects here. Um, so in this particular case, Alex Leveringhouse is going to talk to us about uh, some of the societal aspects here, uh, in particular uh, co to consider about uh, mm -hmm. military applications. And so Alex, I'll uh, hand over uh, to you there. Thanks very much, Mark, and thanks very much, Helen. Uh, for inviting me uh, to speak here. And thanks uh, to all of you for turning up on this rather hot uh, and lovely, uh, lovely day. Um, yes, yeah, so I was given the brief to talk about societal aspects of AI, uh, which is not sort of the easiest thing to do. Um, AI itself is a huge topic uh, philosophically and of course technologically, and of course society is a huge topic too. So, you know, so I was thinking yesterday about what I was going to do, and I thought I'd narrow it down slightly and kind of align my talk with some of the research we are doing in other parts of the social sciences and humanities within uh, the uh, university. So I'm not a technologist by training. I did my uh, training in political philosophy uh, at the LSE uh, back in the day. I also have an interest in ethics. And I'm currently here at, at Surrey as a lecturer in political theory, and I co-direct uh, the Center for International Intervention, which is in uh, the Department of Politics, and which looks, broadly speaking, at uh, international intervention, of course, but which also looks at related issues in the domain of armed conflict and international security. And one of our research strands is uh, military technology and emerging military technologies and their impact on international law, their impact on ethical issues surrounding armed conflict, and of course their potentially uh, transformative impact on armed conflict as such. I want to be controversial, I thought a talk, as a title for my talk, I used the term uh, killer robots. Of course there has been kind of a lot of attention being paid in the press uh, to uh, killer robots. So there is a campaign um, uh, against killer robots that has very successfully um, uh, lobbied the UN uh, in, in kind of various meetings to take legal steps to outlaw uh, the production, design, and development of uh, killer robots. Noel Sharkey, whom probably some of you know here, you know, eminent computer scientist here in the UK, sort of spearheading this uh, campaign from the kind of tech tech side, but there are also various philosophers uh, who have contributed to it. Um, I'm not sort of, sort of too hell-bent just on this kind of term, killer robot, but I think we can sort of talk, talk more broadly about some of the research that's being undertaken in the military uh, domain, where AI, where certain forms of programming, machine learning, um, are going to be used. Certainly the military is uh, a big user, a big commissioner of projects in engineering, of projects in computer science. Uh, certainly you know, advancements in AI, in programming techniques, in robotics will find eventually uh, military applications. Um, I remember once talking to a senior roboticist uh, in the US uh, who said, look, without the Department of Defense, here in the US the field of robotics simply would not exist in its sort of present form. So the military certainly is a big player in funding uh, research uh, in this domain in supporting robotics uh, departments, engineering departments, computer science departments. So it seems to me when we talk about the societal aspects of AI that this is a very important area uh, that we need to uh, look at. Um, I want to start off uh, by talking a little bit about what a robot is. This won't be news to you, uh, but I thought I'd say it, I'd say it anyway. I then want to sort of look at some uh, military applications of robotics. So I've got a couple of robots military robots on my slides. Uh, then I kind of want to pin down what the problem actually is when we look at what the ethical and legal problem is. When we look at military robotics, some military robotics, I take it, is fairly uh, unproblematic from an ethical or legal point of view, but there are other domains, other areas, uh, which are very problematic indeed. And I think it's important to be precise as to what exactly we're talking about and where exactly we locate a particular societal or legal and ethical problem. And then so towards the end, I want to, to 
outline some of the legal and ethical responses to uh, potential advances in military robotics. And I kind of want to show you, I guess most of you are technologists, uh, how you know, someone from the humanities or social sciences would think about the implications of these emerging uh, technologies. So let's set off uh, with something uh, nice and simple, but actually quite, uh, quite complex if one thinks about it. I don't want to sort of chase down the conceptual rabbit hole, but let me just say something very general about uh, robots. So what is a robot? Um, one could argue, although it's not, not uncontroversial, that this is relatively straightforward. And we would usually think that a robot has a certain functions, that a robot uh, has sort of sensing functions, signaling functions, it can move about, it's got energy, it needs energy in order to do certain things, and it's got some form, however one defines it, of intelligence. It needs a governing software in order to do uh, what it is going to do. Without a governance software, it cannot uh, functions. Function. Uh, we would usually think that those functions are integrated uh, into a body uh, as well. And of course, you see R2D2 here, who's got sort of a wonderful round uh, tabby body. And that kind of um, impacts on the definition of what a robot is. So, one definition which I've got up here simply says that a robot is an embodied uh, artificial intelligence. Another uh, de definition says that a robot is an artificial device that can sense its environment and purposefully act on or in that environment. And I think the term purposefully here uh, is quite important. We would usually think that the robot's interaction with its environment does reflect certain parameters uh, set by its programming. It's not going to be an arbitrary actor within its environment. It's there for a specific function. It's there to carry out a particular uh, task. And in that sense, I think we would think that its actions are not completely arbitrary, but indeed they have a purpose, namely to accomplish a task. Of course, as I said, you know, the kind of conceptual undergrowth here is you know, not as straightforward as it may seem. So you know, if you think, for example, about the aspect of embodiment in the definition of a robot, of course, we've got software robots like computer viruses. But you know, the point of these software robots is, is that they lack a body. Uh, still, they've got some functions of a robot. They can move around. They can do certain things. They can interact with their digital environment. But of course, they would uh, lack a physical uh, body. In the kind of military uh, context, uh, how do we define a robotic ses a weapon system? How do we define non-robotic elements of a weapon system? I think uh, you know we shouldn't really sort of chase down this kind of conceptual rabbit hole. It simply, I think, sort of suffices to say that in modern weapon systems, they might actually themselves be robotic, or there might be elements of those systems that interact uh, with uh, a robot. I don't think we have to be kind of too precise in the kind of definition here. In any case, why do we uh, want uh, a robot? Um, we get sort of the four, uh, sorry, yeah, we get the uh, four Ds. We want robots because they do certain tasks for us, uh, tasks that are dull, that are uh, dirty, dangerous, and some would also say uh, dodgy, sort of kind of morally questionable, or otherwise uh, questionable, the four Ds. And probably also tasks, if we think about them, uh, that human beings aren't uh, particularly good at. So this is sort of the four Ds uh, of uh, robotics. Now, if one looks um, you know, sort of to society, where do we find those dull, dirty, dangerous, and probably dodgy tasks? Of course, the military uh, comes uh, to mind. Certainly, the tasks that the military undertakes are uh, very dangerous. Uh, at least, we, I think we can uh, sort of agree uh, on that. Dodgy, who knows? Um, dirty, probably. Dull, yeah, if you think about things like guard duty, for example, they can be uh, fairly dull. Uh, two. So it's not no surprise really that robotics uh, or military robotics plays an important uh, role in the defense sector and plays an important role uh, within the military. And that's certainly reflected by the kinds of systems that we are seeing. So I've got a couple of examples of military uh, robots here. So the first one here is uh, the Dragon Runner robot um, developed by Carnegie Mellon University in automatic incorporated. Uh, it's usually used in an urban environment. It's very portable, so you can easily fit uh, this robot into a backpack. And it's currently used by the British Army in Afghanistan 
and other theatres uh, for the detection of improvised explosive uh, devices. Um, and certainly bomb uh, diffusion, bomb disposal is you know, a very kind of dangerous thing to do and it seems to make sense uh, to use a robot here uh, rather than a human person, if an IED blows up, you know, a robot will be destroyed, but the operator, you know, hopefully will escape unharmed. Um, probably worthwhile saying, so Britain enters into uh, military operations uh, in Afghanistan after, uh, of course, the 9-11 attacks on the World Trade Center. Uh, it very uh, quickly, together with the American and allied partners, founds, uh, finds itself um, confronting a major uh, insurgency uh, within Afghanistan. Uh, that insurgency is partly asymmetric, so the Taliban and allied parties do not seek a direct conf confrontation with the military, but very heavily rely instead on using fairly primitive devices to inflict uh, damage uh, on Western troops, including those improvised explosive devices. And what you see at this time, so 2001, 2002, 2003, 2003 Iraq of course kicks off, uh, that you see a lot of sort of funding from the military pulling into military robotics, partly as a response to those very problems the military is facing uh, on the ground. So the Dragon Runner robot uh, is one of, one of those robots that's currently being uh, deployed within uh, the British military, and I think also other militaries. The Big Dog and uh, the Spot uh, Mini. So the uh, Big Dog uh, was developed by Boston Dynamics, NASA, uh, Foster, Miller and Harvard. And it, uh, that's the one you see at the top. And it was um, designed in order to accompany soldiers in difficult terrain and especially to carry sort of very, very heavy loads uh, for military uh, personnel. Um, I think uh, there are still some hilarious YouTube videos uh, on YouTube, if you have time, where they are trying to get the robot to walk on kind of very uh, different surfaces. And there's one where the robot walks on ice with its four legs. And it kind of it looks really cool how the machine tries to stabilize uh, itself. Uh, unfortunately, or not unfortunately, the project was shelved in 2015. And the main problem was that uh, the big dog robot was too noisy uh, for combat environments. It was powered by a gas-powered engine, and that simply uh, proved to be uh, too noisy. It would have been kind of a sitting duck or a sitting robot, however you want to uh, term it, uh, because it would have been very easily detectable by enemy forces and could have been very easily attacked or destroyed. So that was certainly uh, one of the problems with this kind of system. But surely, I mean, once you've got sort of certain key constituents of the technology in place, you can tinker around the edges. You can try to work to overcome some of the present shortcomings of um, a particular system. And indeed, uh, that was uh, done by those companies involved in the uh, development and design of the Big Dog and the Spot robot emerged, which you see at the bottom here. Uh, this is the Spot Mini, which is now in production at the moment as we speak. And compared to the uh, Big Dog, it's got the advantage that it's much quieter in its operation because it's got an all electric uh, engine rather than a gas powered uh, rather than a gas-powered uh, engine. So that's currently being developed. The downside of this particular system is that it can't carry as heavy uh, in terms of weight as uh, the big dog robot. But that is one application uh, of military robotics and certainly something where we will see more, uh, more development. And the next one will probably be familiar to many, the uh, famous uh, Predator drone. Uh, which you see here, releasing a Hellfire missile um, manufactured by General Atomics, very widely used by the US military, and of course also by the US uh, intelligence services, uh, most notably by the CIA, in a kind of post-11 environment for uh, so-called targeted killings. And the interesting thing about the Predator drone is that, of course, initially, uh, drone technology uh, started out uh, in kind of non, for, for non-weaponized tasks. So the initial uh, use of drones primarily was for observation and reconnaissance missions. So you have a sensor suite on these airborne vehicles. You can remote control them. Gives you a very good view as to what's going on. But of course, once you've got a good view as to what's going on, once you've got a very good sensor suite 
on your uh, on your drone, it's very it becomes very easy to weaponize it, and it becomes very easy to adapt um, the uh, drone to deliver a payload. Once you've got certain things in place, you can very easily weaponize the system. So even I mean, if you think about things, for example, I guess that you might have talked about today, like self-driving cars. I mean, once you've got the technology in place, it becomes more or less easy, sort of to kind of to take the next step and to use the technology to put it into a weapon. Uh, context. So, for example, once you've got self-driving cars, it becomes not inconceivable, it seems to me, just to stick a gun on it or machine gun on it or to have something like a self-driving uh, tank. Certainly, technologically, that can be achieved. So even technologies that are not weaponized at the very beginning, you know, like, for example, drones, they're used for reconnaissance, they're used for observations, can become weaponized relatively easily. Um, the Tirana system, uh, currently in study by BAA Systems, is a stealth plane. It can track and destroy radar stations without assistance from an operator. It can be remote controlled and it can be flown in a sort of purely autonomous mode. Uh, why would you want to have a stealth plane? Well, why would you especially try to automate a stealth plane to a very high level? Yes, because you want to keep the stealth functions um, of the plane intact. As soon as you start, of course, to remote control a weapon system, there will be a communications link between you and the operator and the actual weapon. And that, of course, can be fairly easily detected by your enemy. So if you really want to enter a territory quickly, if you want to strike at an enemy very, very effectively, you want to remain undetected. So in those um, circumstances, it makes sense to have very, very high level of automation in order to facilitate stealth functioning uh, of uh, your weapon. Likewise, if you look at something like the Predator drone that I just showed you, I mean, such a drone will just not be able to withstand a confrontation, say, with a fighter jet. It just won't be able to. So you kind of need to compensate for that. How can you compensate for that? Well, you know, increase levels of automation, you fly at a greater altitude, you fly at greater speed, you try to enter a territory, enemy territory, undetected, and then you strike and you try to leave before your enemy knows what's happened. That's where we see these kinds of systems emerging. And the uh, Tyrannis uh, stealth plane was, I think, tested uh, by the British military in the Australian outback a couple of years uh, ago. I think it was 2015 or 2016. If you look at the BBC website, there's sort of some videos still of the tests um, available. Uh, the Iron Dome, Israeli Iron Dome, of course, very uh, well known. Uh, it's quite controversial. Um, you know, complex kind of software that analyzes the flight path of incoming hostile missiles that then uh, can uh, calculate the course of an intercepting missile and that will give an operator a couple of seconds to decide as to whether to launch a counter-strike in order to shoot down, uh, shoot down an incoming uh, hostile missile. Um, one of the problems in the way that Israel has is, of course, that when you know, Hamas and other groups uh, opposed to Israel fire these rockets into its territory, they very often do this from a kind of mobile platform. It could even just be a moped and someone with a rocket launcher you know, shooting a missile then kind of driving away as quickly as possible. So one of the steps we're seeing in that technology with the Iron Dome is that the Iron Dome will be increased, or the governing software will be increasingly linked to UAVs, which will hover in the air and which will be able to strike uh, the actual launcher or will strike very quickly at the launch site of where a particular hostile uh, missile has uh, originated. Last but not least, um, of course here we have uh, the Sentry robot uh, from Samsung. Sentry robot currently stationed in the demilitarized zone between North and South Korea. Um, so Samsung had sort of a lot of stuff on their website about the Sentry robot, and there was sort of, I think, a couple of years ago, so sort of pride, you know, we've made this and we've designed this, and sort of all disappeared. So I don't know what's kind of happened there. Probably companies are becoming more nervous about their association with the military or not. But this is um, a robot that's um, deployed in the, in the demilitarized zone between North and South Korea. It is a stationary robot, so it doesn't really uh, move around. It doesn't have wheels. It doesn't have legs. It's, well, it's fixed in a certain uh, location. But, uh, of course, it is a weaponized robot. It has two machine guns and one gun that, fire, uh, that can fire rubber uh, bullets. And, of course, if you encounter it, you really want it to take, in a way, you know, the gun with the rubber bullets rather than the machine gun. Now, the point of the Sentry robot is that it's kind of very accurate and in tracking and identify targets up to 
uh, five miles uh, away. And it's very good at distinguishing uh, human targets in particular from potential non-human objects that are moving around in that uh, environment. So it has a very kind of uh, accurate tracking ratio in identifying uh, a human uh, target. Should you ever meet it, uh, it has a micro, or should you ever walk up to it in a foolish moment, just in case you're taking a holiday, you know, in this particular area of the world, which I probably would not, not recommend. Um, um, it has a microphone system, so it will ask you for a password, and it can then analyze in your response whether you know the password, and if you don't know the password, you've got a problem uh, with the robot. Um, at the moment, the system is not um, allowed to operate at its full capacity, so at the moment it is uh, remote controlled and remotely operated. So should you encounter these sentry robots, it will uh, probably ask you the password, but it will alert a human operator that you are standing in front of it, and then you can communicate with the human operator via the uh, loudspeaker and microphone system uh, within the robot. But you can see, you know, again, the kind of technological step is very small. The system is currently used under capacity, uh, under technological capacity, as you uh, could uh, uh, put it. So at the moment there's sort of a human being in the loop, but of course that doesn't always have to remain the case. Now I said um, at the beginning that this talk was uh, about killer robots. So let's try having surveyed some of these robotic systems that are currently being developed by the military, that are currently being used by the military. Let's try to put kind of the killer into uh, the robot, as it were. So look, if you kind of look at a classification of military robots in terms of their lethality, then you have military robots like, for example, the Big Dog or the Spot Mini that are non-lethal. So these kinds of supply robots, you know, robotic pack mules that might be developed in the future once that becomes sort of achievable. Is there a big kind of ethical issues with non-lethal devices? There might be some ethical issues, but it seems to me compared to a lethal device, there really is no sort of big ethical or legal issues with those kinds of machines. At least there wouldn't be any different issues that you, you know, get in other contexts, civilian contexts, such as, for example, the use of self-driving cars, and so on and so forth. You could have also non-lethal robots uh, that have some lethal side effects. So you could imagine, for example, a software robot with which you can hack your enemy's uh, radar system or enemy's air defenses. As that's in and of itself just um, you know, a non-lethal application of a robot. But of course, if the enemy's air force can't communicate anymore or its radar ceases to work, uh, then you might get crashes from the air force. Here the lethal effect is sort of a side effect rather than an intended effect. And then lastly, and I think this is really uh, what we're looking at when we're using the term killer robots, you get robotic and other computer-based targeting systems that are designed in order to apply force to a target, where the application of, the, uh, uh, application of force to a target is not just something that is coincidental, or is not just something that is a side effect, but is indeed the intended uh, purpose or the intended task of a weapon. So something like the sentry robot, something like Tyrannus. And I guess when people talk about killer robots, they have in mind really this third group of robots, i.e. robotic weapons that are directly designed in order to apply force to a target, to search for a target, uh, to find a target and to destroy it. Um, and that, that, that's what we're talking about. And just to kind of reiterate the point about um, the use of automation, AI programming and so on, military robots of course might have loads of tasks that they can accomplish. So you can you know, imagine a drone, it has flight functions, it has landing, func uh, landing functions, you know, it collects a lot of data. If you look at something like the Predator drone, of course it's remotely operated by uh, a human pilot somewhere sitting away in a cubicle in Nevada and uh, that's fine, but of course at the same time it already has a lot of automated functions simply because all the information that the sensor suite from the uh, drone picks up during its operation uh, would be overwhelming to any uh, human operator. So the human operator only takes part, uh, or only takes over certain functions, whereas there's a lot of kind of automation already going on with the system. Now that's fine. However, when we look at what people are really worried about in these robotic weapon systems, then it's really in a way that the decision-making loop that underpins a targeting process within the military becomes increasingly automated. So you could say it's fine that a drone flies or that it collects lots of data about the weather and that you start to automate all of that. That's absolutely fine. Or that a tank sort of drives around and that it can sort of navigate a particular environment on its own without further 
uh, involvement of uh, a supervisor post-programming. What's more problematic really here is the kind of automation or potential automation of targeting processes so that these systems start to acquire information about uh, targets themselves, that they can analyze the information about targets themselves too, that they can decide in quotation marks whether to engage uh, a particular target or not, and that they can then um, enact that targeting decision by deciding whether or not to apply force. Uh, to a particular target. Now some of these um, aspects are already automated. Uh, you know, if you look at acquiring information about a potential target, analyzing information about a potential target, that's roughly the Iron Dome system where the Iron Dome is. However, the Iron Dome of course lacks the kind of decision whether to engage the target. That's left with the human operator currently. Uh, whether that's effective is another question since the human operator I think only has six seconds to decide as to whether to launch um, a counter strike uh, or not. And that's of course not uh, very long at all. You get all sorts of problems about automation bias and, and so on in those kinds of systems. And of course, you know, it doesn't really enact, uh, in its present form at least, uh, these targeting decisions itself. It, uh, that would be, again, left to a human operator who would have to press uh, the button. So we get kind of presently automated targeting systems that have some automated elements of the targeting process. But the question is, you know, how far do you take it? Do you really, especially the kind of last two steps, do you leave that up to processes of automation within such a system? Do you, you know, automate the decision whether to engage a target and whether you also automate the application of force to a target by enacting the targeting decision? What you find in the literature, which I guess will be sort of generally familiar to technologists, is this uh, uh, distinction between different loops or different loop systems. So in the loop systems would usually be remote controlled weapons where the use of force is under direct control of a human operator. All of that is done in a way in the targeting uh, loop. And you get sort of out of the loop system uh, systems and on the loop systems where machines or where weapon systems or military robots, whatever you want to call them, killer robots, act independently of a human operator post-programming. So in an on the loop system, a human operator would usually be on standby and could intervene in the system's use of force. Uh, there are all sorts of questions surrounding that. Um, as I just indicated with the Iron Dome, there are questions about the effectiveness of these standby options. There are questions about the trans transparency of the system and so on. But at least, you know, there would be a human uh, sort of on the loop who could override the application of force to a particular target in the last instance. And then you kind of get these out of the loop systems where the human writer, operator is not on standby and when the kind of machine acts independently or the weapon acts independently where it ha when it, once it has been launched and there would be limited or no ability of the uh, operator or of a human individual to override the machine's uh, targeting process. And of course a stealth system is very much something you would uh, imagine as an out of the loop system simply because you want to kind of cut the communications link in order to remain uh, undetected uh, by enemy uh, forces. And people are mostly sort of worried, I guess, about of these out of the loop systems um, here. Now, how could one respond to that kind of from a humanities, social sciences, non-tech uh, perspective? I just want to sort of run through a couple of arguments to give you a flavor as to what um, sort of has been happening in the field, how these things have been uh, discussed. So one group of arguments are generally sort of classed together under what I call uh, the yuck factor, where people say, oh no, robotic weapons roaming around on the battlefield, oh, we don't want it. There's sort of something yucky about it. Now once you dig a little bit deeper, you kind of see, you know, sort of some arguments emerging. Uh, there. It's not sort of just a gut reaction you know, to robotic weaponry, but there's often there's sort of something deeper coming on. And you see arguments like, you know, robots must not kill humans. And machines must not make decisions about life and death. War, once you have these uh, technologies in place, becomes increasingly riskless. So once you start to introduce these very sophisticated automated systems, you know, the likelihood of war goes up. So, you know, are those good arguments? And it seems to me um, that, you know, you know, there might be some truth to them, but, you know, they're also problematic. So, for example, you know, does it really make a difference if a robot or, makes a, uh, if a robot or a human uh, makes the decision to apply force uh, to the target? And now you might say, and I come back to this argument later, actually, in the talk, but you might say in some circumstances in modern warfare, actually, there doesn't seem to be a big difference at all. 
So for example, if you look at high altitude bombing uh, during the Kosovo War, so uh, this is of course the 20th anniversary of the Kosovo War, in 1999 NATO goes to war against Serbia in response to alleged ethnic cleansing uh, in, the, in the Kosovo region during the post-breakup wars um, of, uh, in, in ex-Yugoslavia, and especially American troops are flying in via you know, bombers which are flying at very, very high altitude. Um, they don't descend in order to drop their particular weapons. They remain at very, very high altitude. What actually happened was that some of the American bomber pilots uh, during this war would set their VCRs. These are the 90s, okay? So they would set their VCRs to record the news. So, by, so just before they would take off, uh, for their mission, they would set their VCRs in order to record the news because they would never actually see what you know their bombs would do. They would fly at such high altitudes. So they would then fly back to the US a couple of hours after flying uh, their mission. They would refuel over the Atlantic. They would kind of um, you know land land uh, again on their base. Then they would check the news <laughs> from the previous day or from a couple of hours ago, which would have been reporting on the effects of a particular military strike that they probably themselves uh, were responsible for. Now you can ask yourself, you know, where is the big difference in this case? If you have something like a Tirana system that's programmed with specific coordinates that can call, that can, you know, navigate a very complex flight path that tracks the radar station, attacks the radar station without human interference, and someone sitting somewhere in a bomber, you know, very, very thousands, thousands of miles up in the air, who sort of gets a message from the targeting system, press the button now and you know, uh, presses it or, or doesn't press it. I mean, here the difference doesn't really seem to be very big between automation and non-automation in contemporary warfare and contemporary weapon system. So some people are worried that sort of, you know, there's sort of something morally fishy about uh, robotic weapon systems and that has largely to do with sort of making decisions about life and death. But do machines really do that? I mean, presumably we would, um, presumably we would uh, program them. I mean, even an autonomous weapon, a robotic weapon, will require some programming. So does a machine really make a decision, or does it really uh, sort of go rather back to its programming uh, and will an active decision that a human operator has made in a way for uh, the machine. With whom does the decision lie? You could so, say probably in a small decision-making loop, yes, the decision lies with the, uh, lies with the machine. But of course, in the bigger decision-making loop of a particularly military mission that a robot will have been programmed for, the decision lies with the operator. And then lastly, sort of this question about war becoming riskless. Well, are we really talking about riskless war or are we starting to talk about riskless killing in armed conflict? You know, would war really ever be riskless if you had a lot of military robots, if you had a lot of uh, automated weapons? I mean, probably not. I mean, you know, we still have superpowers. They still have nuclear weapons. You know, you want to be careful, even if you have a lot of robots. But of course, I mean, you could say, you know, for some parties, very technologically advanced parties that can draw up on these systems, well, war would probably, or killing in war in particular, would be a rather riskless uh, activity. On the other hand, I mean, there's a kind of legal problem here. So for international law, in order to be permitted to kill or to apply force to a target, to, a tra to destroy a lawful target, you do not have to assume the equal risk of being harmed yourself or being killed yourself. So for example, if you look at you know, something like the use of drones in counter-terrorism operations, or even sort of in proper uh, military operations, the fact that the uh, operator of the drone does not really stand any risk of being killed by the target, just doesn't figure for the law at all. The law doesn't care. All the law cares about is that the target under the law is defined as a legal uh, target. So the question of riskless killing, the questions of asymmetry that might be reinforced uh, by technology, well, if you approach it from a strictly legal perspective, it doesn't seem to be hugely problematic. That's just where the law is, and the law is fine with it. So in terms of the kind of yuck factor where people might be uncomfortable with robotic weaponry, I think sort of a lot of arguments that seem to underpin that, uh, you know, they seem to be going in the right direction, but on the other hand, they're also not watertight. Thing as I try to show. Now, what can we say about the law once we kind of take a more structured approach in thinking about uh, these kinds of systems? What can we say about uh, the law? 
The law is relatively clear. Uh, Article 36 of the Second Protocol of the Geneva uh, Convention is very clear. When states develop weapon systems, when states deploy weapon systems, it is their legal obligation to ensure that these weapon systems comply with international humanitarian law. Of course, I mean, that's sort of easier said than done. I mean, the problem with international law, as every lawyer knows, is, of course, enforcement. I mean, that seems eminently sensible to say, that if you develop set weapon systems, if you release them, release them into the wild, you want to ensure that uh, what you do is legal. But, you know, in reality, that's kind of very, very hard uh, to enforce, of course. And to some extent, you have to appeal to the goodwill of states to comply uh, with the law. And the problem is there is no global sovereign that could just enforce uh, international law against states. Now, what can we say about the legal perspective here once we kind of transcend this kind of sort of yuck factor thinking? So, international humanitarian law, which governs uh, the use of force in armed conflict, IHL for short, really makes kind of two major or imposes two major legal obligations on belligerent parties in armed conflict. One is the criterion of uh, discrimination, the other is the, are the criteria of necessity and proportionality. So what does discrimination mean? Discrimination or distinction uh, basically means that warring parties or belligerent parties in an armed conflict scenario are, ob more, uh, are legally obliged to distinguish between legitimate military targets and illegitimate uh, military targets. And they're only allowed to target or intentionally apply force to those targets, targets that are deemed uh, legitimate uh, military uh, targets. So for example, military barracks, you know, straightforward, legitimate military target under the law, may be attacked, may be destroyed. A hospital, of course, not a legitimate uh, military target under international law, legal prohibition on attacking uh, a, a hospital. Very often, uh, when you look in armed conflict, um, or if you look at a lot of the literature, this distinction uh, requirement, uh, you know, uh, uh, so most of the attention with the distinction requirement is usually paid uh, to the distinction between combatants and non-combatants, or combatants and civilians. So the idea here is that there's only a certain class of individuals in an armed conflict that may be legally killed, and those are, of course, combatants. Civilians may be harmed in armed conflict, but only as a side effect of an otherwise uh, permissible uh, military act. But belligerent parties are not allowed to intentionally uh, attack uh, civilians. They're only allowed to intentionally, um, uh, intentionally attack combatants. And we probably also should mention how permissive the law is uh, in this area. So the point very much for the permission to con uh, attack, intentionally attack combatants is that an unlimited number of combatants can be uh, legally killed in war. There is no restriction on it. If you think you need to kill one million combatants in order to rescue one of yours, that's absolutely fine. The law doesn't care. The law just cares about you intentionally atta uh, attacking combatants rather than non-combatants or rather than uh, civilians. So that would certainly be one requirement up on a robotic weapon, that it can operate together or that it uh, can operate in compliance with the criterion of distinction. The other two uh, criteria are the necessity and proportionality criteria. Um, so the, necess the necessity criteria demands that the act, military act you undertake is militarily necessary, and the proportionality criterion uh, requires that the military act you undertake under the law is not excessive in the harm it causes. Now, there are sort of, sort of two, two issues with that. The first issue is that both of these criteria, again, they seem sort of relatively sane, they seem relatively straightforward, but the issue is that they're both highly subjective. How do you pin down you know, military necessity? How do you judge what's really proportionate, what is excessive or is not excessive in terms of the damage you inflict during armed conflict? Very, very difficult to do. There doesn't seem to be really kind of an objective principle that can guide decision making. And the second point is that the proportionality criterion only, so the excessiveness uh, criterion, only applies to any harms that may be inflicted on non-combatants. So if you know, the side effects of a particular military strike would be excessive for non-combatants, for example, by leading to very high 
um, non-combatant casualties as a side effect, then the military act would be disproportionate. The proportionality criterion does not apply to combatants. You can kill unlimited numbers of combatants in war. If you have to kill hundreds of thousands or millions, people will be absolutely fine for that. There is no proportionality uh, issue here. At least the law will be fine with that. There is no proportionality or excessiveness issue here. So how would a you know, system operate, uh, uh, or could a system, could you know, a robotic weapon or some other autonomous device or whatever, could it comply with these kinds of two key principles of international uh, humanitarian law? Of course, some campaigners would say, no, it can't, never ever, you know, it's never ever possible. But it doesn't seem to me that that is quite uh, that straightforward. So when it comes to targeting, for example, it seems to me whether you can successfully automate targeting functions or not while complying with the distinction criterion, that will very much depend on the signature of your target. How good the track record of your machine is, or of your weapon is, in identifying the correct target. Um, probably not surprising that we see the introduction of automation very often into missile defense systems. Why is that? kind of technologically successful? Well, because missiles have a very, uh, a very distinctive heat signature, they have a very distinctive speed signature, and probably also a very distinctive sound signature. So when you think about automation, here the target signature is really quite forward. An automated system could pick that up relatively easily, and it could uh, you know, distinguish a missile from another flying object, for example, an airplane, which would probably uh, fly at much slower speed, would have a different heat signature, and so on. So you know, from that perspective, it seems to me that not every automated system uh, necessarily would uh, fail to satisfy the distinction criterion. So there will be some instances at least where that's possible. You could also uh, think, for example, at, about um, automated unmanned underwater vehicles you know, that are used to, for example, uh, you know, hunt for enemy submarines. Again, underwater it makes sense to automate because my technologist friends tell me it's very hard to use remote control underwater. So again, you could see high levels of automation there. And again, you can say, well, a sub has a very distinctive signature compared probably to other vessels. You know, they're really, from a perspective of discrimination, um, of international, of distinction from international humanitarian law, there really isn't a big issue here. It depends on how accurate the system is in identifying the target it's supposed uh, to attack. Would this work in course in case of humans? You know, the kind of distinction between combatants and non-combatants, I think this is quite, this is, this is much trickier. Um, so if you look at combatants and non-combatants, you look at something like the uh, sentry robot, which is very accurate in distinguishing a human individual from a non-human entity in a particular environment. However, the problem with the sentry robot is that it can tell you, it can't tell you, but it can say, this is a person, that is a rock, or that is a car, that is a person. However, of course, it can't really make the sort of qualitative judgment as to whether a particular person is a combatant or is a non-combatant. So you could imagine with the sentry robot, it could, for example, pick up a child running around. They can say, this is a person, this is not a rock. But of course, it wouldn't necessarily be you know, capable of telling whether this is sort of a child, a combatant, or not a combatant. Um, so there would be more problems there. On the other hand, you know, soldiers may wear uniforms. What are uniforms for? They identify them as member of a fighting force. They identify them as legitimate targets in war. That's why soldiers wear uniforms. Well, why not adapt uniforms accordingly so that machines or weapons can track soldiers. I mean, you know, very unlikely that, you know, states would comply with this or states would like to go this sort of extra mile to make this possible. But at least technologically, it seems to me, even in the case of human individuals, that the kind of international humanitarian law-based case against uh, automated weaponry or against killer robots, if you want to call them that, is not uh, entirely watertight. What about proportionality and necessity? You know, those are very subjective principles, uh, of course, under international humanitarian law. And the point very much is, yeah, sure, probably it would be difficult to automate those kinds of judgments. How would you do it? Uh, the US, of course, already uses um, um, uh, automated systems in order to make projections about casualties uh, during battle. It's called Bugsplat. The informal name is Bugsplat for the computer program because all the potential casualties will appear as little, little kind of uh, red dots on the computer screen. So the uh, military people call it Bugsplat because it looks like the bug has been squatted. Um, so yeah, probably you could install something like that into uh, a robot. The point, it seems to me, is not that machines will find it hard to apply those kinds of principles, but it's all 
falls already very, very hard for human operators to do so. So, you know, I'm, I sort of I take the point that there will be technological limits, but there are already sort of human limits in in place. Um, so that's sort of a, a sort of kind of illegal, so kind of an ambiguous story. I think the law would sort of very much say it depends on whether these kinds of systems are you know legal or illegal. What we partly need to do is to look very carefully, and that would be my approach, at each individual system in order to tell whether it can comply with discrimination or whether it can comply with some of these other criteria. And in some cases that will be possible, in other cases probably not too much. So lastly, just to finish this off. Um, what about ethics? How could ethicists uh, think about this? I talked a lot about, sort of about un, you know, sort of jumbly bumbly yuck reactions to robotic weaponry. I talked a little bit about the kind of legal approach to it. What could ethicists say? And of course, I mean, ethics itself is a hugely uh, wide, uh, you know, field. It's a very complex field. So I guess you will not find a consensus among ethicists as to how to uh, respond to these uh, kinds of. Um, the kinds of technologies that will be quite vigorous uh, dis, uh, disagreement. I mean, sometimes sort of find this in data ethics with AI. You know, we just ask the ethicists what sort of algorithms or what sort of code we can write, and they sort it out for us. No, I mean, there will be kind of sort of fairly big uh, disagreements. So I'm just going to run through an argument that I've come up with, uh, sort of that gave me sort of my 15 minutes of philosophical fame uh, in the world. And that relies on a thought experiment. So one experiment. So one thing that um, ethicists do, or philosophers in general do, is to engage in thought experiments. You know, scientists have experiments. We have thought experiments. But we're also doing experiments, uh, which are which are important. And in a thought experiment, like in a real experiment, you can isolate the sort of issues you want uh, to look at. So what I did in this um, thought experiment was to assume that we can. Uh, uh, create and that we can program the perfect robot. Of course, everyone's going to be, oh, there's no such thing as a perfect machine. Yeah, that's not the point. I mean, you can put all sorts of fantasy conditions into a thought experiment. But what this sort of assumption about perfection, technological perfection basically does, it isolates or it sort of screens out all the potential technological problems and technological objections that you might have towards a robotic weapon system. So at the moment, these don't count. Uh, the robot, the robotic weapon, indeed is perfect. So would there be an ethical argument against uh, using a, a killer robot? Uh, and could we somehow maintain in a way that you know, killer, using a killer robot is bad, even if there was no sort of technological worry about excessive risk, about the machine identifying the wrong target, and so on and so forth. And sort of my argument here was that there is indeed an ethical problem, even if we assume a kind of perfectly functioning machine. And that ethical problem has to do with the change or between replacing kind of human agency in war or human agency on the battlefield with what I call artificial agency. Uh, of a robot. A robot, it seems to me, is an agent. It does certain things. It perceives its environment. It interacts with, it in, with, it, its, with its environment. It causes changes within that environment. So it has some level of agency. I don't have a problem with that. But of course, it in a way falls short of human agency. It is what I called an artificial agent. And I think by replacing, in a way, uh, human agency with artificial agency in war, we're kind of getting rid of something that's valuable about human agency, namely the ability to do otherwise and the ability not to shoot or the ability not to kill. Robots will lack this agency. They will choose uh, to kill if they encounter the target they've been programmed uh, to attack. So for robots, very much, you know, very kind of different agency, an agency which is very much just uh, reflecting its programming code, but which falls short of the human agency in the end uh, not to kill. Now, you know, there are kind of a couple of arguments uh, that you could make against this position. One argument you could say is, well, you know, that's exactly what we want to get rid of. This human agency is terrible. You know, human beings have, of course, they have the ability not to kill, to kind of resist their programming, if you want to uh, put it that. But on the other hand, you know, a human agency can be terrible. Humans, you know, engage in terrible war crimes and they do kind of terrible things uh, to each other. Would it really be so much worse to kind of get rid of human agency and to start replacing it with ever more artificial agency. The other argument would, of course, be against this. 
while Alex, you know, you're very much sort of again focused on this kind of story of combatants and non-combatants of killing in war, but of course there might be lots of other military acts that you might undertake that that are not directly engaged or not directly aimed at humans. And I would say, well, in that kind of context, absolutely, this is sort of a fairly narrow argument that just really. Uh, aims at one aspect of armed conflict, I would, as an ethicist, probably much more comfortable, not as worried about the use of military robots, for example, to search other military robots, or, you know, for military robots to, you know, shoot down drones, unmanned drones or whatever. So I would argue, yeah, you know, automation, you know, some of it will be ethically problematic, especially if systems are designed to specifically target human individuals. But on the other hand, I personally would say, well, you know, as long as you comply with international law, as long as you do a, a, attack the sort of targets you are meant to attack, um, you correctly identify the targets, and the use of force is not excessive, there really isn't a, pro uh, there really isn't a big moral problem uh, with um, automation as such. At least a distinctive moral problem that wouldn't arise in other areas of uh, already existing areas of armed conflict. So probably sort of just um, sort of two thoughts which might be useful just to sum this up a little bit sort of for, for the audience or for kind of a te technologist uh, group, I guess. So one is, I think, that um, the ethical ramifications or societal ramifications of technology are very complex. And you already see this in a relatively small domain, just of a military context. I mean, already here, you know, it starts to matter whether you're talking about a weapon system that would be aimed at a person or whether you're talking about a weapon system that would be aimed at something different. That sort of seems to be, you know, a jet, whatever. Uh, I mean, that already seems to be kind of pretty important here. The other point um, kind of I would make is that um, you see how different kind of intellectual frameworks are starting to impact how you view technology. So there might be kind of these kind of unarticulated things you find in a newspaper, the sort of the yuck factor about technology. There is the law, of course, that has a, 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 that has a very important impact here. There's ethics that has an impact here. So not only is the technology kind of complex, and you need to look at the different ways in which you talk about the technology, but also the kind of different frameworks that apply are fairly complex too. And they may relate in very, very different different ways to the technology you're looking at. Ethics is not, should not be conflated with law and uh, vice versa. I think I just leave it there. So thank you very much.